like to have seen them um, paid down, um, lest you have yourselves a 30-year mortgage with them. Well, we have uh, House Bill uh, 111 in uh, uh, Finance Committee all this next week. We're going to be looking at that. Um, of course, last year we had House Bill 247, which would have addressed those credits, and the uh, Senate didn't step up to the plate on those, kept everything on the North Slope basically uh, the same as it was uh, digging that hole in our budget deeper. Um, so we'll be looking at that, uh, all those. Um, it, it's a little disappointing listening to the um, Senate um, talk about not really wanting to consider uh, broad-based tax and income tax, and so we might have to be looking at um, uh, increasing the tax rates uh, there somewhat uh, over what the Resources Committee did because we are going to need revenue, and if they're not uh, going to be interested in a broad-based tax, then the only way we can get revenue is going with specific industries. So um, I would be looking at some of that this week. I mean, oil taxes and oil tax credits are um, something that's been on the plate for a while. Uh, we know that we need to change them because the system that we have right now is unsustainable. Uh, and even the industry knows it's unsustainable. Uh, in the past, we've looked at just basically the credit portion of the system. But like I say, we might have to be looking at some more of the tax system as well if, if the other body isn't going to be looking at any broad-based taxes. If I could just add, so your question is um, also gets to, we've got all of these credits that we owe, and whether we're going to have to pay those today or we're going to have to pay those tomorrow, and what are we doing to address that? And... Um, I guess today, you know, we, we just don't, we've got a deficit that we're dealing with. Um, you know, we don't have any money, uh, but we know that we owe this. And I think that gets back to the fact that we have to have a fiscal plan. It has to be a long-term, sustainable fiscal plan. Um, and and that's why we've got a number of these other pieces in place um, so that we, we can pay those. And, but, but I think we all do understand that those are liabilities that have to be paid, and, and, and some people think that we should do that today, and some people sh think that we should do that tomorrow. Um, I would say that the question of whether it's today or tomorrow, again, is dependent on whether or not we've got a fiscal plan, and the sooner we can get that in place, the better, and, and we're, we're, uh, we're very hopeful that, that is, uh, that's this year. So. And, and I would just like to say, remember, these are production tax credits so that they can be used against future production taxes that someone would pay. So even if we're not fronting money, they, the certificates are still there, and the tax credits can be written off against future production. That was the whole intention, was to stimulate future production and to allow the credits to be written off against future production. And now we've gotten into this idea that, oh, we have to pay cash up front. We, we have a system that allows that, but there's no requirement that we do that. So uh, it doesn't mean that they're, that they're worthless, but we really need to quit digging that hole uh, at 35% of everything that a company decides to invest, um, we can't uh, afford to do that. And, and Steve, I, I would I would add on that that question. I think action on that on that issue is incredibly important in the state for for both financial reasons and that there's financial exposure to the state, and that's an important piece of a comprehensive fiscal plan. And achieving fiscal sustainability and balanced budgets, but I think it also demonstrates that so to speak, we're all in this together as Alaskans and in industry and Alaskans through perhaps reduced dividends and or broad-based tax taxation and or reduced services. I mean, we all get it. We all have to take sacrifices. And I think action on that issue speaks loudly towards getting to that sort of we're all in it together ethos. And, and I would also add on a sort of more regional perspective, I, I think it also speaks to equitability across industries and I think when the, the tax credit subsidy issue was getting a lot of attention, a lot of fishermen, for instance, in my district wanted to know whether they had the opportunity to stop paying raw fish tax if they had a bad year. And mind you, a lot of them had a bad, bad year last year, and of course they don't. And so when I think people in other industries and economic sectors in Alaska look at the tax credit subsidy regime, they wonder 
why they don't have access to the same sort of economic perks as, as may exist presently on the books with that predict, particular industry. So I think for a variety of reasons, action is really important. Good morning, Liz Raines with KTVA. Representative Seaton, yesterday you mentioned to me that you thought that the Senate's permanent fund bill had to have a broad-based tax attached to it in order to be able to pass the House. And you mentioned the Senate's opposition to a broad-based tax, such as the income tax that's uh, in the House's version now. So I'm wondering what a compromise might look like if um, something like Representative Clayman's education tax proposal or Senator, Senator Bishop's uh, education lottery might be part of a compromise. Well, we'll be looking at all those um, aspects. You know, uh, uh, Representative Clayman's uh, bill is up for a hearing soon. Uh, we have a um, remodel on the income tax based on public testimony that we had that will be out this week um, addressing some of the concerns that were there. But you have to remember that um, SB 26, um, you know, the Senate's plan, uh, it is an incomplete plan. It requires $750 million of cuts over three years. They were going to do $300 million this year, $250 million next year, and $200 million the, the following year. Uh, the problem is that we know that, you know, that's going to be 10,000 jobs lost. And so um, that's not really where we want to see the economy go. don't need a broad-based tax, but the House says it needs a broad-based tax in order to be able to pass a uh, draw from the permanent funds earnings. How do you find compromise? Well, um, you know, that's the, that's the art of politics, and we'll, we'll see how that uh, comes out. If we knew exactly how it was going to come out now, the solution would already be um, on the table on both bodies. So right now, um, you know, we have a uh, difference of opinion, whether we want to have deep budget cuts or whether we want to have a broad-based tax and solve the problem. Uh, you know, and that's, that's going to be the issue that's on the table. And, and if I could just quickly add, um, so as you mentioned, the House would like to see an income tax and the House would like to see something done about oil taxes and oil credits. Um, the Senate doesn't agree with that. Um, the Senate would like to see a constitutional spending limit or some kind of spending limit. Uh, the Senate would like to see deep cuts in the range of, as was mentioned, 750 million over the next three years. Um, you know, both things that you know certainly we don't agree with. But at the end of the day, um, in order to you know come to some kind of consensus on both sides over what everybody wants, or we all know that we're going to have to compromise. Um, you know, we certainly don't have the answer at this point, but. Um, you know, as time is moving forward, we're meeting, um, you know, with the, with the Senate and having some preliminary meetings so far. And, and now that the operating budget's out and, and we're going to start focusing on the capital budget, um, you know, we're going to see these talks, you know, elevate and we're going to have to, you know, answer the exact question that um, or answer that, that exact question that you just asked. And so um, I think we're, we're in the last 30 days now and we're going to have to, um, you know, really figure that out. So. And, and just to remind everybody that the Senate did a large survey, 7,000 people answered their survey, and the minority of their people thought that it should have more cuts, okay? And the majority of their respondents said there should be an income tax, 55%. There were only 46% said that they should have more cuts. So the Senate has an opinion that they should go somewhere which is not apparently in sync with their own respondents to their own polls. So, you know, as, as things go along, we'll, we'll see how things end up. Austin Baird from KTUU. On House Bill 111 on oil and gas taxes, what uh, specifically is possible, what absolutely needs to get done this calendar year? Well, or, or is it, or I sure. guess, or is this more a point of the hearings this week and the focus on this issue is it more setting up conversation for later well no I think that uh, we all agree that we need to go forward now um, these fiscal issues really need to be on the table now it's just like an income tax and income taxes there we're not going to get any until Jan get any money from that f until January uh, 2019 so it's a long lead time so if you wait to do a tax system 
for two years. That means you're three to four years down the line. And so if the system isn't working, it doesn't rapidly respond. Uh, the oil tax uh, credits need to be reformed because it's digging a big hole in, our, in the budget, even as we're trying to have a sustainable budget. Um, you know, we don't want to be doing these things every year, so we need to figure out a solution that will be robust over time um, and work and um, not re require us to be back every year. And you got to remember that more than half of the tax changes that there have been have been requested by the industry. I mean, it wasn't like SB 21 was brought forward by the House and Senate. It was brought forward by industry because they didn't like ACEs. It wasn't like ELF was there because the House and the Senate brought it forward. It was brought forward by the industry because they didn't like the gross tax. You know, PPT, uh, when Frank Murkowski was here, that was brought forward by the industry because they didn't like the aggregation that took place on in um, Kaparik and on the North Slope. So, you know, when people say we're constantly changing the tax regime, more than half the time we're doing that at the request of the oil companies. So, but we want to. We want to have something that will be robust over time at all different prices in, on small fields and large fields. So we need to have something that is um, look, that we look at all those parameters and make sure that whatever system we have will adapt uh, to those automatically instead of coming back and changing uh, oil taxes or credits every two years. And I'll respond to that uh, as well by saying that uh, House Bill 111, uh, uh, in some variation, uh, is a must-have for the House of the session. Sure. James Brooks from the Juno Empire. <clears throat> uh, today we're going to, the governor's going to sign Senate Bill 91. Can you speak to why and how that moved so quickly through the legislature and then the status of the other opioid bills? Well, uh, uh, Senate Bill 91, uh, basically at the governor's behest, uh, allows the disaster declaration to continue. It allows the chief medical officer to work with the Department of Health, Health and Social Services to issue what's called um, a statewide medical standing order uh, for the dispensing, uh, the easier dispensing of uh, naloxone and or Narcan, as it's called. Um, and the beauty of that bill, if you will, is it's got a zero fiscal note. It's uh, funded by a $4.1 uh, uh, million dollar federal grant. Um, so clearly, I don't think it's lost to anybody that uh, the opioid heroin epidemic has swept across the state, uh, covering virtually every sort of socioeconomic uh, boundary that's out there. Um, the bill behind it, House Bill 159, is being heard by uh, the, health and, uh, the Health and Social Services Committee in the House. Uh, that's a priority issue as well. Um, I don't see it going through as quickly, um, given the other circumstances tied to uh, Senate Bill 91 and the need for, for that to, uh, uh, you know, be treated more expediently. But, you know, th this whole issue is just getting bigger, and it's not uh, uh, confined to one area of the state. Uh, the four of us uh, representing smaller communities, uh, a large swath of rural Alaska can, can talk to you at length about the issue. But, you know, it's really swept entire states, and uh, I, I think as time goes on, um, that issue this session and perhaps sadly beyond is going to be even a bigger priority for the legislature. I, I would throw in, James, that um, also there's going to be another opioid-related piece of legislation. I see Commissioner Hoff back in the back of the room, and we've been in consultation with his team that will be forthcoming, I think, a, a complement to the governor's, governor's measures. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, yesterday, members of the Senate majority uh, said that they believe that the um, <clears throat> that the uh, 115 uh, violates a simple single subject rule, and they said that if uh, they were sent a income tax bill separately, it would receive a fair hearing. Uh, what's your response to those points? Well, first of all, um, you know, we've extensively researched it and not only with uh, legislative legal, but also with the uh, Attorney General's office. And uh, we're looking at state restructuring of revenue sources and um, 
there's uh, no single subject uh, problem at all. So yes, we've got, uh, and we'll have the um, Attorney General um, or the appropriate Attorney General testifying uh, before our committee and answering that question specifically. How about the idea of sending it over separately? Um, what I have heard was, uh, oh, it would get attention or like it would be assigned to a committee and um, then uh, not be considered. Um, so anyway, maybe they're going to introduce an income tax bill as well and, and uh, uh, have some kind of broad-based tax. Uh, we would have a little more confidence that they would be willing to do something if they were actually on record. Um, Nat Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. How much of a balance is there um, with the oil tax legislation that uh, your caucus is looking at between what the leadership may want and what is actually able to pass in the House? I mean, do you have concerns about your ability to get 22 or 21 votes for all the items that you guys are discussing? Well, I, I would uh, say that, uh, you know, every bill sort of has to go out in, in terms of the way our caucus looks at things has to go out and sort of earn its 21 votes on the House floor. And uh, those bills you just described are in the process of doing that. And, uh, uh, you know, House Bill 111 um, and House Bill 115, uh, still very much in the formative stages going through the final standing committee of jurisdiction, the House Finance Committee. And so, uh, you know, uh, again, they won't get put on the floor if the support is not there, and if the support is there, um, which I think we are you know, certainly moving in that direction um, uh, of getting the necessary support, uh, they'll get to the floor and uh, you know, be sent over to the other body. If I could just add, I, I think as uh, the speaker mentioned earlier, um, you know, that's something that's a must have for the House, and, and of course the devil's in the details, but, um, Overall, philosophically speaking, I think it's something that is pretty strong support within uh, the majority caucus. So, righty. Well, thank you all. We'll see you here next uh, week, same time and same place. Good morning. <clears throat>